To learn more about earning college credits with study hall courses, go to gostudyhall.com or click the link in the description. Whenever you hear a news story about drug use in the United States, it includes all kinds of scary statistics. Like that 61.2 million people in the United States over the age of 12 used illicit drugs in 2021, and 9.2 million people misuse opioids. Well, here's another number. 46.3 million people in the United States met the criteria for having a substance use disorder in 2021. And 94% of those people did not receive any treatment. Those numbers are all part of the results of the 2021 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which were released early in 2023. This survey has been used by the United States Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, since 1971 to provide valuable insight and data on mental health and treatment in the United States. These surveys help psychologists understand why we do the things we do and provide information to expand and inform better treatment options. But while psychologists are providing plenty of information about addictive substances and treating substance use disorders, that 94% shows that somewhere between providing information and implementing solutions, things aren't quite adding up. Hi, I'm Deja Fitzgerald, and this is Study Hall, Intro to Psychology. To help give us a better understanding of the numbers in that survey and a better picture for why substance use disorders and the treatment of them look the way they do in the United States, we're going to place ourselves on a timeline here in the present, and then we're going to go way back. Because as with most things, these numbers have context, and there's not just any one reason for why they are the way they are. People have been using different kinds of addictive substances for different reasons for literal ages. Like opium has a long history of medicinal use. And when I say long history, I'm talking like 10,000 BCE. The history of cannabis and alcohol use is almost as long with references before 1000 BCE to Egyptian intoxication and a Chinese emperor using medical marijuana what I would give to go to a rager thrown by Cleopatra. Over time, these substances spread around the world, and other plants such as tobacco, hemp, and coca leaves were also used for a variety of medicinal, social, and spiritual practices. We've known about some of the negative effects of these substances for a long time, too. A Greek monk wrote about the effects of alcohol and health in the 1600s, and alcoholism and opium addiction were discussed and written about as early as the 1800s. If we jump ahead to the 1900s, we can take a closer look at the U.S. response to substance use and the idea that alcohol and drugs were harmful. Because around that time, there's also an important shift in the way people in the United States are talking about substances. They really started to focus on the idea that these substances were a problem, not just medically, but also culturally and morally. In the early 1900s, some people in the United States became super concerned about alcohol. They said it was immoral and drinking it led to higher rates of poverty, domestic abuse, and even murder. So on January 17, 1920, the 18th Amendment went into effect, making the production, sale, and transport of alcohol illegal and kicking off the Prohibition era. The idea was that that taking alcohol away would improve society and help people live moral lives. But uh, this didn't exactly work. Instead of eliminating poverty by turning everyone into hardworking teetotalers, closing alcohol-related businesses meant thousands of people lost their jobs. And making alcohol illegal didn't keep people from drinking it. Where there is a will to party, there is a way to party. So while alcohol use rates plummeted shortly after Prohibition began, they then rose steadily over time, though admittedly, they did not reach pre-Prohibition levels. So Prohibition didn't work, but luckily the United States quickly learned its lesson, changed its perspective on alcohol, and figured out how to actually address poverty and other social issues. Just kidding. 50 years after Prohibition, some people in the United States thought certain drugs were immoral and made society unsafe. Sound familiar? In the 1970s, the government declared its war on drugs. This decades-long endeavor involved solutions like 
just saying no, banning drug use, and requiring jail time for people who used or possessed even small quantities of illicit drugs, which according to the definition at that time included marijuana, heroin, and cocaine. But like prohibition, the plan failed. It cost the country hundreds of millions of dollars, had little impact on public safety, sent thousands of people to prison, many of them people of color who received wildly more severe sentences than white people, and drug use and availability still went up. Great plan. But while the war on drugs was mixing up a lot of ideas about morality and criminality, turning a blind eye to some of the real issues in society, and just generally being extremely racist, psychologists were working to understand what's actually going on when people use drugs and alcohol. And their work tried to bring the focus back around from morals to medicine. Early versions of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM, mostly consider alcoholism and drug addiction to be symptoms of other disorders, or lump them with personality disorders. Then in 1980, the DSM-3 listed substance-related and addiction disorders as a separate category of disorder. And more recently, in the DSM-5, substance use disorder was defined as a complex condition where people use certain substances so much that it impacts their daily lives. These changes to the DSM were a massive breakthrough because it meant that doctors and psychologists now view substance use disorders as a medical and psychological concern rather than a moral or criminal issue. And as psychologists have learned more, the DSM has also been updated to include more specifics about substance use disorders. For example, the DSM-5 lists 10 different classes of substances, including things like caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, opioids, sedatives, and hallucinogens. This seems like a broad range of products, but the thing that ties them all together is that they can be addictive for some people, even if they aren't for everyone. And we still aren't 100% sure why some people are particularly vulnerable to addiction and others, not so much. For example, people with certain genes may be more susceptible to addiction than others. And family history of addiction can also play a role. It's also pretty common for addiction to happen alongside other mental health conditions like depression or anxiety for a variety of reasons. But what psychologists do know is that addiction is tied to the reward centers of the brain. These evolved as a way to reinforce behaviors that are good for us by giving us a hit of dopamine or serotonin, which makes us feel good. That makes it more likely we'll repeat that behavior again to get that neurotransmitter hit. Addictive substances can trigger a dopamine response that's up to 10 times what a person would normally experience. Like usually, your brain would splash this neurotransmitter nectar into the synaptic cleft. But with addictive substances, it's like opening a faucet of dopamine. That can cause some people to take substances over and over again to get that dopamine rush, which can change a person's neural pathways over time. And as the brain changes and the body develops in tolerance level, it takes more of a substance to achieve the same dopamine rush. To diagnose substance use disorders, psychologists look for things like whether a person is trying to cut back on a substance, but keeps using it more than they want to, or if they have strong cravings or spend a lot of time trying to get or use a substance, even when it's causing physical or psychological problems, or continuing to use a substance when it's harming their work, family life, or other relationships. The more severe a disorder becomes, the more likely people are to give up things they used to love, like hobbies or social activities. So for some people, substance use disorders are all-encompassing, while other people may still be able to function at a relatively high level, which is why substance use disorders are diagnosed on a spectrum. People diagnosed with a mild disorder might have two or three symptoms, whereas someone with a severe disorder might have six or more. Because psychological research has helped us to understand how substances affect the brain and body, psychologists, doctors, and medical researchers have also been able to develop some effective treatments for substance use disorders. And as it turns out, none of these treatments include banning substances or handing out prison sentences. For example, medications called agonists can activate the same neurotransmitters as addictive substances in a less harmful way. Think of how someone might use a nicotine patch when they're trying to quit smoking. Then there are antagonist medications that block those receptors so substances don't release dopamine. These can help people with alcohol or opioid dependency. We can also combine medication with other interventions like counseling and social support. This is called medication-assisted treatment. 
So for a person addicted to opiates, drugs like buprenorphine can manage a patient's withdrawal symptoms while making opiates less effective. With this aid, patients may find it easier to focus on other treatments like talk therapy, which can help them stay motivated and build resilience through treatment and hopefully avoid relapse. And new technology has given us transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS treatments, which can stimulate nerve cells in the brain and might improve a person's symptoms, like withdrawal and sleep issues. In fact, deep brain stimulation may even be able to strengthen different neural pathways that can compensate for substance dependency, though more research is needed. Another approach to treatment is harm reduction. This strategy involves managing substance use, even if it means a person doesn't abstain from using. The goal here is to create safe spaces for people to use drugs, while also providing them with access to medical and mental health care. This type of treatment is currently highly contentious and federally illegal, but nonprofits in some states have moved forward with establishing these sites and have seen promising results. Despite all these different kinds of treatments, there are still many barriers that keep people from being able to access them. People may not be able to afford treatment. Doctors may not be adequately trained in treating substance use disorders, and there is still a lot of stigma around substance use. The idea that these disorders are a moral and criminal issue lingers, and all that helps to account for the 94% of people surveyed who are not receiving treatment for their substance use disorders. The numbers can be daunting, but amidst all its missteps, poor policy, racism, and misinformation, the United States has shown a capacity for change and for beginning to understand that substance use disorders and accidental overdoses are a serious public health issue in need of diverse treatment options. Throughout history, we can see many instances of changing opinions and policies about addictive substances. Alcohol sales are now regulated, but social drinking is widely accepted. As recently as 2002, nearly 90% of drug arrests were for possession of marijuana. But marijuana is now legal in 24 states, and the United States is putting billions of dollars towards research and treatment for substance use disorders. So with continued research, education, and advocacy, we can continue learning more about substance use disorders and how to treat them with compassion and care. And we can make sure that help is available and attainable for the people who need it. If you're enjoying Study Hall, Intro to Psychology, and are interested in taking an online course and earning college credit, go to gostudyhall.com or click on this button to learn more. Thanks for watching. See you next time.